So let me tell you a story. A few years ago, I was working for a cloud provider, and I was doing a change. It was that strange time between the US was still sleeping. I mean, the maintenance window was there. But the folks in Europe were still sleeping as well. So I was alone in my deployment. Everything was OK. It was green, so green, green is OK. Green is happy. And suddenly, I started to see red on the screen. And you can imagine my reaction when I saw the deployment. Deployment is red. Another system is blocked in the deployment. And I started to, OK, I can see the message. It's there. I can see what it says. But I don't understand what is happening. <laughs> And the bad thing is that I am alone. I don't have anybody to ask. So you can start realizing, OK, how I was feeling in that moment. And I think many of us have already been on these kind of situations. And now the, let me tell you another story where I was doing also a change. This was for a customer in South Africa. I was at Cisco at that time. Um, OK, we were working. It was fine. Everything was OK. We shut down an OSPF interface, if I'm not mistaken. And we lost management of the device. And like I said, we were in Mexico. The device was in South Africa. So it's not that like, a, OK, we can go and just uh, manipulate the device, right? Um, for that same reason, I was already stressed. What can I do in this case? But if you hear, I say we are, were working. Because I was not alone. I was with more engineers. We were doing some troubleshooting. And then we remember, hey, we are moving pseudo wires. And I remember I saw this in VLAN. So what if we turn on the pseudo wires that goes through the device? And we did, and we recovered the device. And then we can fix the, the OSPF issue on the interface. It, between those two experiences, it, for me, it was uh, day and night. In one occasion, I mean, it was very stressful. And in the other occasion, it's a good memory that I can remember from time to time. And when I see my fellow engineers, it's like, oh, yeah, do you remember that occasion we lost the device? So when this thing of AI started, this is an idea that I remember. And I said, hey, what if I can use this AI thing to be my assistant, to be my body who can help me to troubleshoot when there is an issue on the network. And that's how I started, OK, let's try it. Let's do it. So before going on that part, I just would like to introduce myself very quickly. I'm Jesus Illescas. I work as a developer advocate on DevNet. I'm very passionate about network engineering DevOps. So if you have any idea you would like to see on DevNet, please reach out, and we will be happy to help. The agenda that I have prepared for today is why? Why we are doing this? The challenges, OK, when I started to build this solution, I started to have some questions. And I would like to share that experience with you. Then I would like to go step by step on how I thought, OK, let's build this system. And the part that I consider very, very important that this is like the point where I the gears started to rotate in my head. How to interact with AI programmatically? How can I have this kind of superpower? And then if everything goes well, we will have a live demo. And I hope the gods are hearing us, because if something fails, well, I will have to show you a video. But uh, no, I want to show you something real. And then we will wrap up. Something that I'm not covering today is uh, fine tuning. That's a whole different thing. And in my case, I'm already using something that is built. And I'm not going to go into the details of every component, because there are many moving pieces on the solution, so there's no time. But uh, reach out, and we can talk. So let's start with the why. Well, I already show, showed you some story. But uh, I'm realizing that every day I'm really using, for example, this Hopcock Copilot to start working. 
And for me, it's quite useful. Uh, my background is networking engineer, but sometimes I have doubts on the software engineer, and I'm using Copilot just to ask questions, to see, OK, what do you think about this? It's like my Dover, uh, Docker Rover debugging thing. So it is something that I'm, fi I'm finding quite useful. And I'm receiving the help that I don't have. Uh, sometimes I'm alone. I don't have someone to ask. OK, I'm getting some, some help, and I quite like it. And the other thing that I'm realizing is that if I can use AI to work less, I'm happier. The less I work, the happier I am. So in this case, for me, it's the perfect uh, thing to use. Now let's talk about the challenges. When I started to, to go on this uh, experiment, what I found. And for me, the main challenges were two. How can I send the data from my network devices to the AI? And especially, how can the AI access my network devices? So for me, this was like, OK, I, I'm not sure how to do that. And that's basically how I started to build the solution that I'm going to show you. So let's go with building the system. And the first thing that I saw was, OK, I need to pick a network transport. Somehow, my devices need to communicate with the AI. So what are the options that I have for this? And in this case, I have my traditional methods. We have our old good friends, Telnet, SSH, SNMP, logs. But at the same time, we already have like very good programmable interfaces. So we can use something like netconf, rescon, or gnmi. And I will say, in this case, check what are your options, your requirements, and pick the one that is the best for you. Because for example, for the demo that I built, I had to choose netconf. And what I choose netconf, very basically, because GNMI is not supported on the virtual IOS XC that I'm using. So after some time spending, OK, what is not working, I check, OK, it's not supported. So I'm using netconf. So this is some consideration that you should have. OK, what I can use, what is supported, what is not supported, the OS I'm using. And then I have the netconf. I was, OK, I'm already grabbing some data from my devices. How can the devices or this data, how can I send it to the AI? And in this case, the next thing is to pick an observability solution. I need something that can grab my data, and can, I can do something with the data, and then I can send it somewhere. And in this case, because I'm really building something for my own, uh, the best thing for me was, OK, let's go to the CNCF uh, landscape, start looking around, see what is there. The main requirements that I had were, were OK, I'm using netconf. I need something that supports netconf. And I need something that can react to some metrics in this case. So what I did was to choose the tick stack. In reality, the tick stack, in my case, is quite simple. And I was surprised that it's very easy to integrate between each other. And the best thing is that I have webhooks. Because I don't want to send everything to the AI, in my case. I'm only interested when an event happens. OK, I want that event to be sent to my AI. I don't want to send everything. And the webhooks are the part that can help me, OK, grab the data, something happens and then I can send it. Now, we need to choose an LLM. Uh, there are many options. So I need to choose something that works in my case. And this is a page that I found. And in my case, it's quite useful, because probably a few months ago, there were not many options for an LLM. But right now, there are many. And to pick the best one is not that easy. Again, goes, uh, it goes on your requirements. For example, if you need something on-premise, then you need to check what will work on-premise. And in my case, for example, I, I saw, OK, GTP4, it looks good. Uh, it's quite powerful. 
Okay, probably I can go with it. But something that you also need to consider when you are using an LLM are, is the context window. How much data or how much token you can send to the LLM. And this is quite important because if the content window of the LLM is very small, uh, you will need to start doing some uh, techniques to do some summarization so you can send the data to the LLM and you don't have an error with the tokens. So the context window is something important. And the good news is that, I mean, ev every I don't know, every week can be, there's an advance on the LLM field and the context, context windows are bigger now. But it's still, it's a good consideration. For example, I believe Genemai right now supports 2 million. So yeah, this already is a bit old. But yeah, keep in mind the context windows, but at the same time, the price. So if you are using so, something that is hosted somewhere else, yeah, pricing, it will also cons uh, matters. Now, um, there's another option to choose an LLM. If you are looking at something that is open source, a good page is Hugging Face. So you can go there and you can see the models. Uh, you can see the training data that they use, for example. So it's, it's a good place to start looking around. If you are using one model of them uh, and you want to, to use it on-prem, on -prem, then, of course, you will need to host the the LLM, right? You need the resources. But there is another option that I consider is quite good, and personally, I, I like it. And in this case, it's Oyama. And I like it because the developer experience is super smooth. It's very easy to use, very easy to download models. Uh, if you want to customize your model, not fine tuning, just do some sort of customization. It's also quite easy to use. Um, for example, I was used, uh, doing some tests on my laptop, which is an M4 with Mistral, and I was surprised. I was surprised how easy it is. But for today's session, I'm not actually using Oyama. I'm using, in this case, a model from OpenAI. And the reason is the model from OpenAI right now is super easy to use. The developer experience is quite smooth as well. Uh, to tell you the truth, GPT-4 behave way better than other models. Or for example, uh, when I was doing my test 3.5, okay, it was working, but uh, I had to, to ask the other, okay, please do this, please check this part. And you will see with the demo of GTP-4, okay, it's different. That part is, is, is completely different. Now, Let's go with the part that I consider more important, and in my case, I like to develop stuff, I like to build stuff. This is the part that I consider quite interesting. I already have data coming from my webhook. Something happened and I have the data. So now, what I need, right? I need a system that is able to receive data. That data needs to be sent to the LLM, because I'm not hosting the LLM since I'm using OpenAI. But another part that I consider relevant is to interact with users. I, I would like to do some stuff with it. And very basically, I, I choose to use a REST solution. So basically, an HTTP server in this case. And I saw, OK, FastAPI is really a good server in this case, quite easy, quite useful. And for interacting with the uh, LLM, I choose to use WebEx because it's super easy to create really a bot. And in this case, if I use this library that you can see, I have WebSockets. And I consider that was really good. The next part, you see I'm already using Python, right? So the next part is, OK, I want to interact with the AI programmatically. And I need to choose a framework. For frameworks, we have many options. There are many. Uh, for example, Autogen is from Microsoft, and I consider it is quite good. But in my case, I prefer to go with something more agnostic, and I choose Langchain. And again, based on my requirements. So when we take a look at Langchain, it's really a whole ecosystem. Uh, 
Uh, in this case, for example, you can see it has some observability, some deployment, some templates. But what is important for me in my solution is the abstractions, because I can keep it a bit neutral. If I want to change related to another uh, LLM provider, it will be quite easy. And then I have two characteristics. I have chains and I have agents. And in this case, the agents is what really interests me because I don't want to reason for the AI. I want the AI to reason, and that's why I choose the agent part. The next part, how can I interact with my, the AI with my network? And if there is only one thing you can remember from my presentation, this is the part that I consider, OK, please remember this, because for me it was, OK, when I get the idea of how this can work. And very basically is the concept of tools. AI have some concept of tools on some frameworks. For example, in LangChain, you can see we have a way to interact with OpenAI. And the reality is that it's a um, decorator in Python, in this case, that is really converting my function into a JSON so the AI can, can understand. And this is like I, I commented here, it's not specific for LangChain because Mistral also has, for example, the tools. But you need to understand the format that they are using to work on it. So that's why I consider, OK, LangChain can help me. And in this case, you can see a, a tool for OpenAI. But how the tool looks like. So this is one tool that I'm using. As you can see, it's a function with a decorator. But see how specific the name of the function should be. I need to tell the AI, OK, this function is doing what? And then what is expecting? It's expecting a device name. And you can see I'm, or I'm using typing even in Python. I mean, it's not really re relevant. But the, for the AI, this is important. Device name is a string, and I will return a dictionary. Even though you can see below on the return, I have so something saying, OK, output to JSON. But still, for the AI, it's important. Then the doc string is also matters because this is what AI is going to be reading. I'm saying very specifically, this is will retrie retrieve the ISIS neighbor. And I'm also saying that neighbors down are not included. Then I'm also saying, OK, the device name must come from this function specifically. Now, the prompts also matter in this case. It's very important that you have a good prompt for this to work. Um, I know it's a lot of text. I don't expect you to read everything. But the great news is that, as you can see on the URL, you can find the source code for my example. It's public. You can go and you can see the details of how everything is built. Uh, I put the code in a way that you can uh, recreate it if you want using a DevNet sandbox. But the tip that I learned from doing the prompt is that use another AI to help you build the prompt. In this case, I was doing my prompt. I was testing. I see, OK, the result is not what I was expecting. I was checking with GitHub Copilot, hey, I'm building this prompt for this AI, and I want to do this. It's not doing it. Please help me to refine it. And GitHub Copilot helped me, OK? This is the prompt. I tested the prompt. OK, it was not working. I was checking. It was, uh, I don't know, some sort of collaboration work. And in the end, I was, I was able to have the prompt I was OK, happy with. And I mean, the demo is working with. Now, remember, we already have a solution to host the LLM. We already have a solution to interact with the AI. But we need the AI to interact with the network devices, right? So the last part is that we need a way to retrieve the data from the network. And the good thing is that, I mean, we already know how to do that. And we can go with our all good friends, traditional methods, native programmable interfaces. We can use them. But when I started to, OK, trying to build a solution, trying to, to build uh, the example that I'm doing, I realized that, ah, this will take me a lot of time if I'm doing it. If I need to have the netconf payload for all the functions that I want to check, it will take me a bit of time just to, I mean, investigate, 
put it, put it on, into a function and work on it. Um, like I commented before, the, the less I work, the happier I am. So I thought, OK, there should be a good solution for this part. And the good thing is that there is, we already have some frameworks to interact with network devices, right? We have, for example, Batfish, Napal, Nornin, Ansible, of course, NSO. But for example, we also have frameworks like PyATS. So in, in my case, since I'm not really using NSO for my example, I wanted to keep it a bit neutral. I decided to go with PyATS. OK, I described you the whole solution, the whole system. Now I would like to show you how it flows, how the flow is. So initially, the observability solution is grabbing data from the network devices. Then an alert happens, something goes in the network, and this alert from the observability goes directly to WebEx and directly to the user. But also the same alert goes to Fast API in this case. Fast API in this case goes and call, calls uh, LangChain, and then LangChain calls the agent. If you can see, I put some colors. In this case, I forgot to put that uh, red is a function, in my case, a Python function, which is pretty fast. The AI agent realizes, OK, I have some tools available. I can use them. So LangChain starts using PyATS. Um, PyATS basically calls the network devices. Now, the beauty that I consider on this part is that the AI doesn't really know, OK, I'm interacting with uh, this device, I don't know how to reach that device. That's something that is delegated to PyATS. So there is a good, you can do some nice separation of concerns between what the AI is responsible and what you are doing in this case, for example, with PyATS. PyATS receives data from the devices and passes to LangChain. LangChain goes, passes the data to the agent. And if you see this kind of, uh, well, the color is quite is not that good on the screen. But basically, the cycle that I'm trying to say is that this is what it looks like if the AI is doing some reasoning, is doing some sort of troubleshooting. This is one flow, but in reality, we'll start doing several, st several times the same flow. And once it's able to have an answer, basically, the AI agent will go with LangChain. LangChain will go to FastAPI. Fast API will go to WebEx and very and the, in the end to the user. So now is the, the moment of truth. Let's go with the demo. And for the demo, I had some very basic scenarios. You can see three devices, iOS XC. Um, I prepare a, a very basic uh, alert. In this case, is what happens if an ISIS neighbor is lost. And very basic, basically, I create a, created a rule that says if the average network and ISIS devices in 30 seconds is less than the average ISIS, na net, ISIS na neighbors in 30 minutes, send an alarm, an alarm. So this is a good way, OK, I don't really rely on numbers. If two is less than, than one, I mean, it can be end, end, end devices, right? So let's go to the computer. Uh, let's see. I hope it works. OK. My screen is not appearing. OK, is there. Let me make it a bit bigger. So like I commented, I have my network devices. This, this is a CML instance. I'm using a DevNet sandbox. So you can do it on the same sandbox. Here you can see I have Grafana. 
Grafana is already grabbing telemetry data from uh, the devices using netconf. This is a special metric that I had to manipulate, like Roque commented yesterday, that I had to do some manipulation to get the, the data that I wanted. But let's go to this device. Let's go to the console. And like I commented, basically I have an alert that will trigger when I have less than the number of ISIS devices. So, okay, this is responding. And let me check. Okay, the VN is working. So the first thing before I forget, for this demo, I created a repo. Okay, what I'm going to do is to start the server. So run LLM. Okay, this will start my Python container. Inside Python, I have the code where I describe the solution. And it will start the HTTP server. It will also start the connection to WebEx. Okay, the server is up. Now let's go to CML. Let's do show IP interface brief just to see, okay, this is up, show ISIS neighbor. Okay, I have my neighbors. And in this case, I'm going to shut down the interface gigabit file. So let's go there, interface gigabit file, and shut down. So I should see in a moment in my telemetry data how the ISIS neighbors are down and how the interface goes down. Okay? I see there is a change in this part. My green hair now is yellow, okay? It's no longer green. And remember, green is good. And red, red is bad. So let's see. Okay. In WebEx, I already have the notification. And the notification says that there is a ISIS neighbor that is down on which device. And that's the only thing. So this webhook was sent to the AI, and that's the only information that has the device, and something happens. So let's go to my server. And in the server, you can see here is the message that, that was sent from um, Grafana in this case. Right now, it's started to do some initial analysis. OK, it's down. What are the initial steps for troubleshooting? And it will start, for example, in this case, check that the device exists, do, review the logs, do some health check, review the interface status, check the ISIS neighbor. And now it's started, OK, to, to gather information from the devices. And this is the flow that I shared before when it looks like it's reasoning, OK, what is happening in this case. So. Let's continue. You can see it's going to the devices, grabbing some information. It found some relevant logs, for example, in this case. Um, it started, for example, in this case, to check the health of the device. It says, OK, no CPU health issues detected on the device. And by the way, this is something that I manipulated from PyATS. So the AI knows, OK, if I see this message, what it means. Okay, for example, you can see the next step is the interface status verification is starting to review how the interface looks like. Let's continue. You can see it's also doing some analysis in this case. And also check the ISIS neighbor. And I believe this is the final analysis. So if I go to WebEx, you can see that I received a summary. So all the analysis that the AI did, I mean, it's not presented to me. It just presented to me a summary of what happened or what I found. The analysis, OK, the ISIS, uh, for example, in this case, B1 is up and operational. Both, in this case, is saying, the ISIS neighbor is likely related to an administratively down status interface. And remember, this is the original alert. 
So it's not saying which interface is right. This is something that the AI was able to do by itself. So in this case, it's asking me, uh, would you like to proceed uh, bringing back the interface? And actually, this is something that I had to do manually. I had to put on the prompt, don't, do, don't bring back the interface without my permission, because the AI was already doing that part. But uh, I don't feel comfortable uh, that the AI is taking that power. But in this case, for example, I can say, yes, please bring ISIS back. I'm not saying which interface and which device. I'm just saying, yeah, I want ISIS. So in this case, let's see. You can see it received here the message, my message. And now it has also a function that is called on shot interface. And it's calling with the device name and the interface. And now it's back, the interface. Now let me see if it already answered me. Yeah, it says, OK, the interface is up. And I will say, in the demo that I recorded, uh, it also verified ISIS, the status of ISIS. And in this case, it didn't. So uh, that's something that you have to consider with uh, AI. It's not quite deterministic, but probably this is good in my case. So let me ask, um, can you check how ISIS is? And OK, it receives my uh, what I ask. And it's going to start checking the ISIS uh, status. But I can also, in the meantime, I can also go to Grafana. And I can see the, the neighbor count for ISIS is back to normal. I can see the interface is already up. If I go to the device and I do the show IP interface brief, I can see it's up. And if I check the ISIS neighbor, I can see it's also up. So yeah, finally, we can see, OK, it's back. And let me see. And very basically, I mean, you can see it is quite simple, the demo, I will say, is just checking ISIS. But consider this was an experiment I wanted to do. I did on part time. Imagine if you have a team of developers that is working and providing tools for the AI. And actually, on the considerations that I have, uh, one of the considerations is Imagine if you have multiple agents. Imagine if one agent is doing like the general troubleshooting, and you had one agent for ISIS, you had one agent for MPLS, you had one agent for BGP, and they work independently checking their tools, and they, they go back to the results. This part with, uh, with AI can become more and more powerful. Other considerations before I forget. Check your company policies. This is super, super important and super crucial. You don't want to get into trouble. So that's why on DevNet, we offer the DevNet sandboxes. You can go, you can replicate my example. The only thing that I'm not providing is the uh, AI key. That's something that you will have to bring yourself. The other part important is the functions. The function name and the description should is very important. Otherwise, when I was doing the experiment, I had some strange results. And basically, the AI was thinking the function could be used in another way. Or I started to see some hallucination. It started to use devices that doesn't exist. So I have to be very specific. The first thing you need to check is get the device from the devices that are available for, for, from your inventory in PyITS. The tokens limit. You can blow up your tokens very easily with telemetry from the devices. So be sure you are filtering, be sure you are sending to the AI what you are really using. And if you are using an AI LLM that is uh, SaaS, I mean, this can impact your bills. The alarms are quite important. In my case, you saw the Grafana alarm that I use. It was super generic, and this is because I was having issues with Grafana. But if you have good description in your alarms, 
you are very specific what you are sending to the AI, the troubleshooting will be faster and, and better. Having said that, what I consider that could be a good next steps is you had the code of this example available. You can go, you can clone it, you can see the details, you can see the prompt that I use is quite uh, specific, and you can improve it. Take a look at Lanchain on, on the agents part. I wasn't able to start playing with multiple agents, but there is now a, a good library called um, Lanchain Graph which it looks like is, is quite easy to use agents. And also Autogen on Microsoft is making quite easy to use several agents. So take a look, play with them. And again, on developer.cisco.com, on the sandboxes, you, you can replicate my example. Um, and it's free. So you can go, you can use it, and uh, yeah. So this is the end of the presentation. I hope it can give you some ideas on how uh, you can use AI to your advantage. I hope that uh, you can see how you can have like some sort of body. So the next time there is an issue in your network and you are the engineer trying to resolve it, you don't feel like I feel that time alone and very stressful. You have very immediately a, a summary and you say, OK, yeah, this is quite easy. I can fix it. So yeah, thank you for your time. Thank you for that, Jesus. Uh, we do not have any questions at the moment in Slido, so if you want to ask a question to Jesus, don't hesitate um, to post something, and we can um, take it through. So a question from my side. Um, so this is a very interesting demo. I really like the idea of having an AI agent that you know helps the, you in network operations and mm -hmm. basically can present, you know, here's a problem, and here are some remediation steps. How do you foresee this is going to play out in the future, that you're going to have a battery library of AI agents, um, where maybe one agent is using other agents and so forth? Um, you know, can you speculate a little bit what the opportunity is here going forward? Yeah, uh, I think, I mean, this is going to be not in the future, but in the present already. There are already solutions that are starting to use multiple agents. Uh, so yeah, what we see uh, with the use of multiple agencies, I think going to be present or is already present for everybody. Um, and, and something that I forgot to mention and I consider important is that I have to tell the AI how to troubleshoot, what steps. And this is something that as network engineers, we still have that knowledge and we, it's something that we are putting on the tools. So yeah, I think this is something we can leverage the AI to do. All right, <clears throat> another question. So, I mean, you've built this demo that you shared here with us. How long have you been working with this? I mean, what is the learning curve for um, somebody who wants to get up to speed, um, you know, go to your repository, learn mm -hmm. these things? What, 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 what can you expect to achieve in, in what time frame would we uh, talk about to well, get up to speed? In my case, it took me, I don't know, probably a month. A month, yeah. Yeah, but the thing is that uh, I look online and there were not examples. So basically, I built examples with my mind and what I thought. But now that you have an example that is already working, I will say it could be quite quickly. And I don't know, I'm using NetConf, but you can switch to a GNMI. For the AI, is the same. Uh, the AI is not aware of the protocol you are using, for example. Yeah. So now we have a question. Let me read it out. How are you unshut down the interface in the demo or take any action in general? Is NSO in picture or the AI figure out the right commands? Yeah, that's a good question. Basically, the unshut uh, command, uh, we can say, is a function. It's a tool that I declare in Python using PyATS. So the yeah. AI have a, have a list of functions available. And very basically, it says it, it, it can see that there is a tool saying that it's unshot the interface. Uh, I'm not using NSO in this demo, but if in NSO there is an action available, there should be a, a REST API for that action that you can use. Yeah, all right. Yeah, clear. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks a lot. Um,